In the last video, we witnessed how Activision began to capitalize on the rising potential of their new Star IP after the game's first critical and commercial success by getting third-party developers on board to develop add-ons and spin-offs to tap into the console market. But none of those titles were able to compete with Infinity Ward's true sequel, Call of Duty 2, when it released in 2005. It sold more than twice as many copies as its predecessor, got practically buried in rewards, and received fan approval and paved the way for an even brighter future for the Call of Duty brand. So without further ado, I'm Drifter, and I'm Ragnar, and this is the history of Call of Duty. Since its inception, Call of Duty had managed to firmly establish itself as Activision's most lucrative franchise, a circumstance that naturally made the company's shareholders very happy. So happy, in fact, that they demanded an annual recurrence of this monetary success. In order to please them, the publisher decided to, from that point on, release one major Call of Duty title each year. Up until that point, Infinity Ward, the studio that had innovated the brand in the first place, was responsible for developing the main entries in the series. But since they needed at least two years of development time for their next title, Activision subsequently promoted Treyarch, the studio that had proven themselves with Big Red One into the main series development cycle. From now on, Treyarch and Infinity Ward would take turns in releasing new Call of Duty games each year. And since the latter had just recently started working on their next title and, as previously mentioned, would require two whole years to finish it, Treyarch was once again met with an extremely stunted development time for Call of Duty 3. According to Noah Heller, senior producer at Treyarch at that time, they had only been given eight months to produce the game from start to finish. To accomplish this, they almost doubled the size of their staff to compensate for the short time frame. But this relentless deadline would negatively impact the final result in several ways. For example, it forced Treyarch to rely on their own proprietary Treyarch NGL engine, instead of transitioning to the technologically far superior IW engine. Another huge drawback was that since Treyarch only had enough time to develop Call of Duty 3 for consoles, the game would not see a PC release. Activision was mostly fine with that decision since the PC version of COD 2 had sold significantly less units than its console counterpart, but denying the PC community a release of the next major Call of Duty installment arguably left the first dent in the franchise's reputation among hardcore fans, giving the impression that the once charming underdog had grown into a corporate cash cow instead of a labor of love. Call of Duty 3 was released almost exactly one year after its predecessor for the Xbox, and that's Xbox Original, Xbox 360, PS2, PS3, and the Nintendo Wii, and even though it wasn't able to surpass Call of Duty 2 in terms of sales or critical reception, Treyarch definitely deserves some kudos and praise for delivering such a densely packed product in such an incredibly short amount of time. A solid single-player campaign that introduced Polish, Canadian, and French resistance troops into the lineups to add diversity to the often rehashed depictions of Normandy campaigns, and a multiplayer mode that dominated Xbox Live for months. Overall, the critical reception was generally favorable, and Treyarch had passed their rite of passage and was now granted two years to develop Call of Duty 5 since Infinity Ward was working on their fourth entry in the series. Now, at that time, World War II was everywhere. Aside from Call of Duty, the Medal of Honor series had repeatedly released similarly themed titles, just as many other developers had tapped into that same market, with that motif even carrying over to the real-time strategy genre. The Second World War had quickly grown into one of the most common video game themes, and the market became, or rather already was, oversaturated. And as we've mentioned in the previous episode, Infinity Ward had already foreseen this trend years ago. Before starting with COD 2, they had already tried to convince Activision to shift the series into a modern setting, but had always been rejected. With Call of Duty 4, they pitched their idea once again, except this time, Activision reluctantly gave in, and only because Treyarch was already making another World War II game. So in case this modern warfare experiment would flop, they had another ace up their sleeve. After getting the green light, Infinity Ward went the whole nine yards with the project. They almost doubled the size of their staff, employing nearly 100 developers, designers, and artists to work on their next title. World War II shooters had long since started feeling like a constant rehash of the same old gameplay and ideas over and over again, but the new modern military setting offered the designers and writers access to a plethora of new gadgets, technology, locations, and all sorts of resources that would lead to completely new ways of playing and experiencing a military shooter. 
More than any game that they had previously developed, they can aim for an unprecedented diversity in game feel from mission to mission. Cloak and Dagger Spec Ops assignments would immediately be followed by large-scale marine airborne invasions and would sometimes feel heavily inspired by such contemporary films like Ridley Scott's Black Hawk Down. They approached this new setting with the same passion and attention to detail that fans had come to expect, by spending a great deal of time interviewing active duty soldiers and special ops about their experiences in modern conflict zones, attending various live fire exercises at a nearby US Marine base, and by hiring military advisors to make the game feel as authentic as possible. The game narrative's near-future scenario granted the writers a creative freedom the customary World War II setting simply hadn't allowed for, and gave them the means to craft a completely unique narrative arc with an alternate future, which would include one of the most iconic twists in the entire series. At this point in time, it was common practice to craft the single-player campaign of an FPS first and then tack on the multiplayer in the later stages of development, but Ben Simpella had come to the realization that an impeccable online experience was becoming more and more important for the longevity of a first-person shooter. As a consequence, Infinity Ward decided to split their team into two dedicated groups from day one. One of the teams would focus entirely on the single player campaign, and the other team would focus exclusively on the multiplayer mode, and together these groups would technically be developing two separate games concurrently. Call of Duty 4's multiplayer mode would be a well-received reimagining of the standard online shooter formula, due mostly to the emphasis on player progression and customization. Where most multiplayer shooters had gone for the every competitor is equal approach, Modern Warfare enabled players to customize and outfit their characters' loadouts to accommodate each user's own gameplay style, with a plethora of unlockable weapons, gadgets, attachments and many other features that added an extrinsic long-term motivation to the fast and engaging moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of online matches. Infinity Ward also introduced kill streaks for the first time, rewarding players for consecutive kill chains by giving access to powerful gadgets such as UAV surveillance, airstrikes, and remote-controlled helicopter attacks. It took the addicting simplicity of old-school video game high scores and gave it a much-needed, more visceral coat of paint. Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare launched on November 5th, 2007 for Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC, only two months after Halo 3 and just three weeks before Ubisoft's highly anticipated Assassin's Creed. But despite the very strong competition, to say that its success went beyond anyone's expectations would still be an understatement. Within a matter of only a few weeks, it surpassed the sales of all of its predecessors, add-ons and spin-offs combined, and left all of its competitors behind. In just the final nine weeks of 2007, it managed to become the number one selling video game of the year. Modern Warfare's single-player campaign, which told the story of a fictional near-future conflict spanning over locations such as the Middle East, Azerbaijan, Russia, and its iconic sniper missions set in Pripyat, Chernobyl, was once again met with overwhelming critical acclaim, pushing the cinematic intensity of all of its predecessors beyond anyone's expectations. The multiplayer mode, however, managed to achieve the unthinkable. It by far surpassed Microsoft's juggernaut title, Halo 3, as the most played game on Xbox. Xbox Live. By January 2008, only three months after its release, Call of Duty Modern Warfare had already sold over 7 million copies worldwide. Its commercial momentum didn't fade, which became evident when Activision released the Variety Map Pack DLC on April 4, 2008 on Xbox 360 and April 24 for PlayStation 3 and finally on June 5 for PC. It earned over $10 million of revenue just in the first few days of its launch, thereby becoming the most successful downloadable content of all time, at least by 2008 standards. But while Infinity Ward was collecting accolades from all sides, having now proven their publisher's assessments wrong for the third time already, their colleagues at Treyarch were already more than halfway through the development of the next entry in the series, Call of Duty World at War, which would revert the series to its time-honored World War II setting, the safe bet in which Activision had so desperately wanted to invest, in case Infinity Ward's modern setting experiment would fail. However, it didn't fail. To the contrary, an Activision suddenly wasn't happy with World at War's direction anymore. After Modern Warfare's overwhelming success, the publisher approached Treyarch with many drastic changes in mind, even considering forcing the studio to shift the game's setting into a more contemporary one at the last minute. Luckily for Treyarch, though, the team had already invested way too many resources into the project to justify making such a radical change. 
World at War single-player campaign would feature two different storylines this time around. Following US Marines in the Pacific theater of war through the battles of Makin Island, Peleliu and Okinawa, and on the Russian front, depicting the Soviet campaign against Germany, once again starting with the Battle of Stalingrad and eventually ending in the invasion of Berlin and the Reichstag in 1945. Having been given more space and resources this time around, Treyarch employed Infinity Ward's IW engine and put a lot of effort into pushing it beyond its boundaries. For example, they aimed for a more mature approach for World at War by implementing partially destructible environments, dynamic propagating fire, and for extremely graphic and realistic depictions of burning clothes and skin, as well as dismemberment of limbs if enemies were hit by large caliber rounds. The sound department went to great lengths to make the experience as cinematic and immersive as possible. They hired Hollywood actors Kiefer Sutherland and Gary Oldman to lend their voices to some of the main characters. They also developed an acoustic occlusion system which alters loud sounds such as muzzle cracks and explosions depending on their surroundings. The engine was built to dynamically modulate frequencies so, for example, a gunshot from a distance would have a significantly different sound than one that was fired inside an enclosed space or from behind a concrete wall. But while Activision couldn't change the setting of the single-player campaign, they did order Treyarch to completely overhaul the multiplayer mode that was in the works so far. Where the developers went for the traditional approach, as seen in the titles before Modern Warfare, World at War's multiplayer had to be completely rebuilt to feature similar progression systems with kill streaks and multiplayer customization options that the massively popular Modern Warfare had. Treyarch implemented an additional cooperative multiplayer experience in which players had to fight off hordes of Nazi zombies and survive for as long as possible. The zombie mode would soon become a trademark of Treyarch's Call of Duty games. Call of Duty World at War released on November 11, 2008 for Xbox 360, PlayStation 3 and PC, and although it was met with a generally positive reception, it couldn't compete with its predecessor's massive critical acclaim. And much to Activision's dismay, despite being an enormous financial success, it stayed behind Modern Warfare in terms of sales, which meant the final nail in the coffin for World War II as the established and beloved backdrop for future titles. Join us next time to see where Infinity Ward would take the newly established Modern Warfare series, this time dedicated not to repeat the same mistake previously made with the Call of Duty IP and claiming it as their own very proprietary brand, and how happy Activision was with that decision. If you'd like to check out Part 2, or if you'd like to skip ahead to Part 4, both of those annotations are on the screen. Part 4 will be out in a few days. If you want to subscribe to me, that would be nice. Liking the video, leaving a comment, or if you'd like to go check out Ragnar's channel, I'd appreciate that too. It's linked first in the description. Crypto out.